Welcome to Unit 2, which would be chemistry or biochemistry, and that's uh, the basis of life. To start out with, we talk about two main areas of chemistry. There's inorganic and organic. And if you're going to major in chemistry, generally you take a year of inorganic chemistry followed by a year of organic chemistry. And this used to be what would to help qualify or prepare a person to take the MCAT exam to get into medical school. And generally you take inorganic chemistry before you take organic chemistry. Organic chemistry would be those chemicals that have both carbon and hydrogen bonds. Inorganic chemicals would be pretty much all the rest. But sometimes people say that organic chemicals are those that have to do with life. And that's not the best definition because water and carbon dioxide are closely associated with living things. Uh, water is produced by living things, it's used by living things, carbon dioxide is produced by many living things, and those are both considered inorganic. Water contains hydrogen, but it doesn't contain carbon. Carbon dioxide contains carbon, but not hydrogen. Therefore, those two chemicals are inorganic. If you read in scientific journals, sometimes you'll see the expression inorganic carbon, and specifically what they're referring to is carbon dioxide. As we consider uh, this part of science, this part of biology, we want to understand matter. Matter is described as anything that has volume and mass. That would be most things that you would think of. There are some things that are not considered matter. A good example would be energy. Energy has neither volume nor mass. It has uh, speed, it has movement, but not volume and mass. Some Sometimes I'll ask students in my face-to-face -face class if gas is considered matter. And if some of you have worked around gases, you'd be able to answer this. It does have volume and it does have mass. If you've ever tried to move a tank that has a gas in it that's uh, been condensed to a liquefied form, it has a much greater mass or weight than an empty cylinder, whether you're talking about a scuba tank or oxygen or carbon dioxide, nitrogen, acetylene, whatever it might be, natural gas, propane. The, the tank will always weigh more when it's full of that gas than when it's empty. And for a number of those gases, uh, propane, uh, natural gas, especially propane, it's liquefied because it doesn't take up as much volume. The um, chemical element, and I put chemical in front of it just to to verify that, but uh, on the test I would just have this as element. A chemical element is something that cannot be broken down into anything else or changed anything else by ordinary chemical means. And all the atoms that make up an element, or that are considered a given element, all would have the same number of protons in their nucleus. And I'll be talking about elements a little bit later on. Chemical symbols with the uh, chemical symbols, if you we're going to be looking at a periodic table in just a little bit, but uh, in a chemical symbol, there there'll either be one letter or two letters. The first letter is always capitalized. If there is a second letter, it's always lowercase. Some of the chemical symbols are from Latin, and so when you look at the chemical symbol, it doesn't seem to be connected with the name. But I've got three examples, and these actually come from the Latin Fe. Some of you would be very familiar with this because uh, you might work with metals. Fe stands for ferrous or ferric. Sometimes I'll drive by buildings and uh, industries and they'll, they'll advertise that they work with ferrous materials. That means iron in the Latin. That, that was the word for, for iron and it's applied for iron today and uh, they use Fe. Cu, many uh, would be familiar with that. That stands for copper. It actually goes back to Latin cuprus or cupric. And uh, the Romans were very familiar with iron, copper. And the third one, PB, which uh, is an abbreviation of plumium. Uh, that's lead. The, uh, the Romans used all of these. And um, the plumium is what we get the word plumber from. And it used to be that plumbers used lead in sealing their pipes. And uh, my understanding is, I was told by a plumber a few
few years ago that uh, they're still required to understand how to use lead, even though they don't use it anymore, but especially with packing vent pipes. So you can see those all have two letters. The first letter is capitalized. The second letter is lowercase. The uh, I don't have much to say about the, the trace elements, but uh, the four most common elements that you should be very familiar with would be carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And those aren't necessarily in the order that they occur in living things, but uh, those are the four most common elements. And you should be familiar with those, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. I have a periodic table that I pulled off the internet and I provide the URL. It's https colon a double front slash ptable.com front slash. If you want to look that up and if you want to have it for yourself, you're welcome to go get it. They even show the URL in the image. And so I did a screen capture of the periodic table, actually the um, whole uh, page on the computer even with uh, the web address showing. And you can check and uncheck boxes. I've got the weights and names. I did not check the electron box, but uh, you're welcome to do that. And you'll notice these uh, elements are arranged in order by their atomic number, and that would be the number of protons in their nucleus. They are not arranged by weights. If you were to try to follow through here, you'd notice that the weights are actually off. As a matter of fact, argon has a heavier weight than potassium, which is K. But they are in the proper order by atomic number. With the periodic table, as you're looking at this, most of the elements on the left-hand side of the periodic table are considered metals. Actually, most of the periodic table goes far over towards the right. You see this stair step arrangement uh, over towards the right, and that separates the metals from the nonmetals. The metals, most of the periodic table over here to the left, and the nonmetals in the light green and the, the blue over in the upper right hand corner. And what this means is these nonmetals excluding the noble gases or inert gases, they will tend to gain electrons, try to pick up electrons, and the elements way over here on the far left-hand side, especially the first two columns, but even in the, um, the D, what's called the D sub-level here in the middle, they'll tend to give up electrons, an electron or electrons, depending on their configuration. And so that makes a big difference in how atoms bond each other. So we've got the metals, we've got the nonmetals, and then we have um, this very specific group called the noble gases, the inert gases, and they have full outer electron shells, and they don't want to bond with anything else. I think in the 1960s, uh, some chemists were able to get xenon, to bond with fluorine. Fluorine is a very reactive nonmetal, the most reactive nonmetal there is. Because it's so reactive, they were able to get it under laboratory conditions to bond with xenon, but generally these won't bond with anything else. They just occur as single atoms. When you look at the periodic table, the columns tell you specific things. And different periodic tables are arranged and labeled differently. But um, you see the first two columns on the left. All the elements, atoms, in that column would have one electron in their outermost shell. In the second column, two electrons in their outermost shell. We skip the D sublevel. I don't teach about the D sublevel or the F sublevel. The uh, D sublevel, the F sublevel, that lactonide and actinide series. Let's save that for chemistry. But you jump over here to what they're calling 13. Sometimes they'll call this row 3. All these have three electrons in their outermost shell. The next column 4, 5, 
6, and 7, and then all the elements in the inner gas column, the noble gas column, they have full outer shells. Helium can only have two because in this first period or first row, uh, the first shell can only have two electrons. Once that's filled, then the second shell can have eight, and that's why there's a gap between the hydrogen and the helium. Because hydrogen has one, helium has two, helium is full, and that uh, fills the, the first shell. The rows on the periodic table, and they show one through seven, those represent periods, and that's why they call it a periodic table. The periodic table was first put together by uh, Mendeleev, Dmitry Mendeleev, a Russian scientist back in the 1800s. And in the 1800s, not all the elements were discovered, so he left gaps in the periodic table with the understanding that eventually an element would be discovered and that's where it would be placed. Quite fascinating. I may have mentioned that helium was actually discovered from uh, electromagnetic rays coming from the sun back in the 1800s. It was, it was understood to be on the sun before we actually discovered it here on the earth. So what happens, these first columns and then the D sub-level elements, they tend to give up electrons and the uh, non-metals, excluding the noble gases over here, but over here in the upper right hand side, fluorine and uh, these, what are showing in the light green, tend to take on electrons. And fluorine is very reactive. Oxygen and chlorine are fairly reactive. That's one of the reasons why uh, metals rust with oxygen. They, ox they form oxides. And chlorine is a, a good killer of uh, organisms because it's so reactive. The opposite happens with the metals. It says you go down and to the left. So francium is the most reactive metal there is. And as you go up, the reactivity decreases. But still, sodium and, uh, excuse me, potassium and sodium are fairly reactive. Potassium is more reactive than sodium. If you drop pure sodium into water, it'll jump around, fizzle, it'll cause heat to be formed, and hydrogen gas will be given off and sodium hydroxide will be formed, which is a base. If you're to drop potassium in, the, uh, the same thing would happen, but it, enough heat would be produced that it would ignite the hydrogen in many cases and get a little blue flame above the water. You can take a look at the periodic table on your own and uh, observe the different symbols for the different elements. The great thing about this periodic table, it gives you the symbol, it gives you the name. If you wanted to go to the website, click on uh, the box that says electrons, it'd show you how many electrons are uh, associated with the, each nucleus in that atom. That's about all I'll say on this part, and I will continue on a second video in this series for Unit 2.